Today on The Whitney Reynolds Show, we're looking at a new wave of adoptions, open that is. See how millions of lives are changing for parents and the adopted children. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you. And the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live. Picture this, you're at a restaurant and sitting right next to your birth mother, but have no idea. In the older days of adoption, this scenario could have easily played out. However, today's guests have put a plan into action to prevent this from happening going forward. We're talking open adoptions. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. Ahead of the curve on open adoptions is our first guest, Nalay. She has worked with the adoption agency known as The Cradle and is here to explain why this organization chose to go with open adoptions. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So first of all, what is open adoption? Open adoption is when there is a relationship that exists between the adoption circle and the adoption circle is inclusive of the adoptive parent, the birth mother, and the child. And openness can be different things to different people. So one can have a one um, adoptive parent can have a relationship where openness is where you see birth mom um, once a year. Another person can see birth mom. Uh, three times a year and others can just talk with birth moms on the phone or text or things of that nature. So it's definitely between the biological mom, the the adoptive mm -hmm. mom and the child and it is all inclusive of the circle. Absolutely. And it just changes based on situations. Absolutely. The relationship can vary from family to family. So the cradle decided to go with open adoptions and why I feel like this is very key for our viewers to know and to understand what open adoptions is, is that before everything was closed. People didn't want to know who the birth mothers were, are. So why did you decide to go this route? Well, the cradle went with openness probably in the early or mid 90s and the cradle decided to go that openness route because we wanted total transparency, uh, transparency, especially some of our birth moms when we would talk with them about adoption, they start to ask, where is my baby going? What kind of family is my child going to? And we thought long and hard about this and we thought that open adoption was the way to go, to have total transparency. And since then, all of our, most of our adoptions have been open. Have you seen that since you've opened them up, the flow is just overall much better for the children and the parents? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are some benefits to openness. Um, back in the day, you know, back then when the adoptions were closed, um, parents had to hide things mm -hmm. from their children. There were secrets in the house. You were afraid that a relative may say something and out you. There are no secrets with openness. The other benefit of openness is that what if something happens with your child? You have that relationship with birth mom and birth father. You can contact them and, um, you know, if, if something medically goes wrong with the child. And the other one is just that sense of, um, a birth mom putting her trust in you and, and knowing that this very hard decision that she had to make, um, she's okay with it because she knows the type of family that was selected. So there are some advantages to birth, um, to openness. So people that are tuning in might be thinking right now, well, that's easy for you to say, Nalay, because you're not in this situation. You work for the cradle. But you actually went through this in your personal life. You adopted a son and you have gone through this with the mother of your son, the biological mother. And I love what you said is that one of my children came from my belly and another came from my heart. 
and you've dealt with this firsthand. So what has it been like? I mean, everything you're saying is just not by the books or how your business is run at the cradle. It's really like what's played out in your own life. Yeah, um, you know, when we came to the cradle, there's always a fear of openness. And I go out into the community re to recruit families. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one fear. I often ask by a show of hands, how many people are open to openness at the beginning of my meeting? But by the end, we see so many more hands when they get to understand that. And I can share a little bit of insight from my experience with my son's birth mother. So I often tell the families that are in attendance, um, I've lived what you're going through. I sat in those very chairs and I understand the concerns and, and the fears that you have around openness, but openness is good. And the other thing that people have to understand that openness is not for the parents. Openness is to benefit the child. Openness is all, away, all always about the child. That's one thing I think we forget is um, most of the time whenever you have kids or you're um, thinking about having kids, is you're always, like let's just say a pregnant mom, is, everything's for the baby. Everything's for that baby. But sometimes you can lose that whenever you're adopting because you start thinking, well, we're going to have to go through this. We're going to have to do this. But really, it's all about that baby. And what you're saying is, I mean, it's better for the kids. Absolutely, and the Cradle's mission is to benefit children and all others um, touched by adoption. Mm -hmm. And we always say it is always about the children. Our our babies come first. Our infants are number one, mm -hmm. and um, that's what openness is about. It's not about me. It's not about my husband. It is about what is in the best interest of my son, of my child, and it's important that he knows that this decision was made out of love. It was done one way for so long, but coming up later in the show, we're actually going to talk about how laws have been passed to help the openness as well. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your personal story and also what The Cradle is doing with the open adoptions. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Our next segment is extremely special because we have two moms weighing in on their perspective of adoption. One is the biological mom that gave her son up for adoption, and the other is the woman that adopted him. They are giving us a first-hand look on how this all plays out in real life. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Thanks. We've been talking about open adoption today, and I'm going to throw the first question to you, LaTanya. What was it like knowing that you were going to adopt and that your son's birth mother would be involved? Well, initially, I'd say it was pretty scary. Um, but after attending a lot of the cradle classes and having other adoptive families come in and speak to the group, it was a little bit more comforting. I also wanted my son to have as much information as he could. And so I wanted him to be able to ask health related questions. I wanted him to be able to know where his extended family was and what that connection was for him. So Elizabeth, you had to give up your son. What did that look like for you? It was hard. It was very hard. Um, from the time he was born until the time he was sick, and you know, I thought about in the back of my mind what would people think or what what my mom would say and everything. And I was like, you know what? I have to come up with another plan because I don't want him traveling from place to place, place just like I was doing before I had him. So here you have this baby and you wanted, you wanted to keep him, mm -hmm. you really did, yep. and um, he was sick, and it was kind of like you're running out of options on how to do it. What was that moment that was like, this is going to be the best idea for all of us? It's, it's really undescribable because I had to think quick, I had to think quick, and when I mean like quick, like five minutes quick. So I decided to, you know, give Cradle a call. And they told me to come in for an interview. Me and my mother came in and I met up with the you know, representatives. We met um, at different places in Chicago and she was, we met at coffee houses and stuff. And she was like, um, here are some pamphlets and everything. And then that's when we came across uh, profiles, different profiles. I've seen many profiles, but it was one profile that caught my eye. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? This is going to be a winner. I could tell they're good people, oh. good Christian people. And I just believe, you know, I didn't choose that family. God spoke to me mm. and chose that family. That's amazing. And said, this is it right here. He's going to be well taken care of. 
we can we can do this. And my mother, I remember my mother crying, said, Liz, this is gonna be a tough road. Are you sure you wanna do this? It's like, Ma, what other choice do I have? Right. I'm not in school at the time because not only he got sick, I got sick too, you know, mm-hmm. lost oxygen and everything. Uh-huh. So it's like, I'm weak and only thing I can do is think at the time, so. so it- so you decide to do this, and like you said, it was one of those moments that you're like, this all makes sense, the stars aligned. And um, and I sometimes call those God winks, mm-hmm. you know, where you just kind of yeah. see like, okay, I got you, kid. Um, but with that, now you're on the receiving end. So had you already been doing classes and there was no match yet for you for, to adopt? I had, I had actually um, fit, completed the classes. At the same time, probably about two months prior, I had received um, a phone call and I had a change of heart. And so we were almost at the point of adoption at one point. Uh, So we were still actually in the middle of dealing with that when we got the call. And so you get this call and what, what is the first step to open adoption? You like get to meet the kid and the mom? Like, how does that work? Like, did y'all all meet all at once or did you have to let go and then be re-entered back in? Well, I had to go up to the facility first because I remember he was in there and I know he had to stay there for a while because of the things was going on at home. And then, you know, when I went up there a couple of times, I kept on coming up there to see him and that's when one of the uh, representatives was saying that uh, we, you know, we could schedule a meet now with the, the I mean, the uh, adoptive parents. And I was like, oh. I'm going to be stuck because I am super nervous. And then she gave me the date that we was going. And it was a week later. I was like, I hope they like me. I know I'm going to like them. Aww. So it, it it was very emotional. But the road and the journey I had to go on, undescribable. When we were working on the show, I, was, um, I have a few adopted relatives, um, not siblings in my life, but just relatives that were adopted. And My first thought was going back to the way adoption kind of used to be, where everything was closed. You didn't want to know because you were worried that if they knew their mother, they might love her more. What's going on with that? And what I'm what I'm seeing happen on the set today is beautiful. And I think if people can take in what's actually happening here in this new wave of adoption, where you are open, you are real about family. You know, like we had these health issues. This is maybe what an uncle died of, or this is what's going on, or, you know, and then even getting to celebrate life marks together is huge because you're still getting to be a part. And I think if you can grasp it, I mean, it's just beautiful what's happening here today. It is. I actually I called Liz about three weeks ago or a month ago to ask her some um, medical history information. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to be able to pick up the phone and send a text message to find out, you know, had there been some history. After we leave the show today, we're gonna go and see him and we're gonna visit his school. And so we have a whole evening planned. Yeah, that was my last question. What is life like now? Like he knows both of you very well. And what is life like now? I'm gonna, I'll let you answer that, Latanya. So I'd say he, he has a nickname for her. Um, <laughs> but yes, he knows her very well. Um, we talk about it all the time. He knows that, you know, mommy's tummy was broken and I grew in, in Poo Poo's belly. And so, <laughs> you know, he definitely knows this. And I'd say um, currently where we are now is that we're pretty open about our communication. We touch base about how we feel, about where we are in the process. You know, is this too much openness? Is it mm-hmm. not enough openness? And really being receptive um, about the things that might be difficult, you know, whether I would like more visits or she'd like more visits, and then being able to be respectful of what that is and have discussion around, you know, what those things entail. Elizabeth, do you ever, does it ever hurt you whenever you hear him call mom, or is that part of her call mom? It, like, um, or is it part of the process? It's part of the process, but in the very beginning, it kind of hurt a little bit. And then I was like, you know what? You are, you are always going to be his mom. Mm. And and Tanya is going to always be a part of my life. Her whole family going to be a part of my life. Thank you both for being so open and sharing your story. and. 
you know, just the impact that you're making across the board, even in with sharing your story so other families know what life can look like on this end. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have the viewer's voice where we take it to the streets to find out what you think. This week's question is, what does family mean to you? Family are the people that you can totally hate and love them at the same time. And uh, family is basically all you need like in life, you know. It's love. It's all about peace and love. And it's about helping each other, getting through everything together, never feeling alone. And when you do feel alone, to remember to reach out to your family member because they love you whether you think they don't do or not. Family means to me everything. It's beautiful as good as self. Biological family is not family. For me, family is people who one feels comfortable with, who one feels themselves with, people who support each other. It's now time for our social sizzle, and if you don't already know her, meet Sarah Feigenholz. She is an Illinois state representative of the 12th district and has worked to pass laws to improve the practice of adoptions and authored and passed birth certificate access in Illinois and adult adoptees. Welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so tell us what we just talked about because you've been working hard for the state of Illinois. So I, um, have, I was adopted. And I uh, always felt that I should get a copy of my original birth certificate. And it's actually kind of a national movement. Um, even though every state uh, passes their own law, this is, there is no one law that governs birth certificate access around this country. Every state uh, has uh, the ability to determine whether or not they allow birth certificate access. So when you say birth certificate access, so you a lot of people don't know. Yeah. People, a lot of people don't know. They're like, wait a minute, you're adopted and you were never able to get a copy of your original birth certificate? Never. Until this law passed, the document, when I got my birth certificate, it had the name of my adoptive parents on it. The law did not permit me to see the name of my, of my biological family. When did you get the fire to like, kind of like you said, this personal experience, here you are in, you know, you're, you're making different changes in the city, you're making different things in Illinois, but what made you personally take this on? Was it something that you knew that you would want to do whenever you came into office? Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, I think that um, it's, a, it's, it's like any very civil, a civil rights issue, whether it's uh, non-discrimination, the death penalty, gay marriage, whatever marriage equality, yeah. um, it's, it's something that you feel is an injustice that you need to correct. And that's how I felt about it. Because I found my birth mother uh, through some methods that some may think were in the gray area right. of the law. And, and trust me when I tell you that none of that really mattered. I had to do this. I had to know my, I need, had to know my beginnings. I needed to know the circumstances of my birth and I needed to know the first chapter of my life. And when I learned, when I finally met my birth mother through whatever methods I used, um, she filled in a lot of empty spaces. Um, and, and what was very dark and very mysterious, you know, and as a child, children do very well with the truth. Right. They do better with the truth than they do with secrets and lies. Um, and I believe that the current practice of adoption around that most children celebrate gotcha days, psych psychologists will and social workers will tell adoptive parents that the second they feel that their child is prepared to know, know this, they should just burst the balloon and say, you were adopted, your birth mother was a wonderful woman, here's the story, and, um, and, and you were born on this day, but today we're going to celebrate your gotcha day. Oh, you know, I, I mean, it's the a gotcha day. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So did anything change personally for you with your adopted mom when you found out who your birth mom was? You know, the choice that I had, you know, I did this when I was in my 20s. Um, I, I decided that I wanted to uh, search for my birth mother while my adoptive mother was alive. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then I would decide whether or not I would share what I had discovered with her. And I chose not to share it. Okay. Yeah. I, but I will tell you that um, 
that my birth mother only made me love my adoptive mother more mm -hmm. because she told me this so many stories about how they met um, when I was born my my adoptive mother was a physician and my my adoptive mother took care of my birth mother mm -hmm. when she was pregnant with me and was in the room when I was born what a beautiful so story. it's kind of a unique situation you're not going to hear that very often right um, my birth mother asked my my adoptive mother to adopt me Wow. It may have been one of the first open adoptions. Yeah. Uh, you know, because birth mothers in those days could never find out who was adopting their children. So your birth mother asked your adopted mother to adopt you, but your adopted mom never told you her name, even though she knew it. Yeah. And then that's when you put this into motion. Yeah. So in Illinois, this has really changed the way we do it now. Oh, yes. What is it looking like for other states? Well, 13,000 uh, adoptees have got their original birth certificates in Illinois, which is, Illinois was the largest expansion of adoptee rights wow. in, the, in North America, frankly. Amazing. Yeah, because we're like the fifth largest state in the country. And after we passed our law, the state of Washington, even the state of New Jersey, um, and, o and, uh, and Ohio, some very large Rust Belt states and you know kind of conservative states have done this and it you know again everyone's great discovery is that the sky hasn't fallen. Uh, 32 states are not doing this. Uh, many uh, there's a handful that are right on the cusp. Um, there is a national organization that is a hub for uh, you know for people out in TV land who are watching this. If you don't, if you weren't yeah, born in Illinois, yeah. if you weren't born in Illinois, or your adoption wasn't finalized here, or in the 18 states that permit access, you need to kind of go figure out what's going on in your. Where do they in, do that? It, well, there's a, a organization called the American Adoption Congress. They have a website, and on their website, they have a list of all of the states and the efforts that are going on and the names of people who are on the ground sponsoring the legislation and advocating for it, visiting state capitals and doing media campaigns. It's amazing what has happened in Illinois um, with everything you've done. What is your like, what's a personal story mm. for you that you've encountered with maybe an adoptee or someone oh that's contacted your office for what you've done? You know, I don't know that I could actually um, I, I don't know that I could actually single one out. There are so many, and we don't have enough time. Mm. But what? But some of some of them were spectacular, uh, just spectacular, and so spectacular that um, you know this was my life's work. It took me about 14 years to pass this into awesome. law, and the first thing I did when I got home is I took a writing class because I said I'm going to write a book. And my girlfriend said to me, write a book? <laughs> this is going to unfold in the next 18 months. You have to make a film. Wow. And so that is, I, I, I was like, oh, I think I'll make a film. <laughs> and I worked with a, a great, a wonderful filmmaker. Her name is Jean Strauss. Um, she uh, has done many, many short documentaries on this subject. She is an adult adoptee from the state of California, a state that may never open birth yeah. certificates. And she is, again, you know, we're a family of adoptees who are very committed to this. And she made a film that has been on PBS oh. called A Simple Piece of Paper. Oh, man. That's something they definitely will have to check out. That is yes. amazing. And it is really a great uh, documentary because what it does is it, it shows... Uh, maybe 16, th somewhere between 11 and 15 adoptees in the state of Illinois, how they felt before they got their birth certificates, what it was like when they, we actually have, in this documentary, there are many openings of the envelope. Oh my goodness. I we, mean, it just will take your breath we away. We have to check yeah. that out. And, and what ensued after that? Some of them were really amazing stories. A lot of people lost the opportunity to meet their birth parents because they were older and um, you know it took so long. I mean there's a gentleman who in the film was 74 years old. The governor of the state of Illinois handed him his birth certificate personally and there was not a dry eye in the room. I mean Can this man imagine? never thought 
in his lifetime that he would ever get a copy. And just, it, it's a great film. And it, it's a great film. It's inspiring and it's, it crystallizes to non-adopted adults how important this is. Things that they, they're like, they see the film and they're like, wow, I never realized all that what, how emotional this was and what this meant to people. And so when you ask me, back to your question, every day I get an email, mm -hmm. every day, Aww. especially in the first three or four years after this happened, I would get an email from somebody that said, that Thank said you. if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have met or if we're, you know, if you, you know, thank you for passing this law. I mean, I have every day, and what I would do is I would put them on my Facebook page and say, here's today's gift. Oh, I so, love that. You know what, I'm a, I, you know, there's some people who are in the world wondering what their purpose is. I'm not one of them. Oh, that is beautiful. Well, thank you for everything you've done. And thanks for coming on the show and, and sharing your story. Oh, thanks for having me. Family can mean many things. It can mean people you're related to or simply people that love and care about you. This week's guests have shown how powerful open adoption is in the lives of children and how it can help bring families together. Our show hopes to inspire all sides of the story. For more information on today's show, visit WhitneyReynolds.com. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you, and the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live.